Our issue segment tonight, in his final address to the nation, President Obama made some touching remarks, but he couldn't resist the urge to engage in environmentalist fear-mongering. He warned us about waves of climate refugees and said that denying climate change not only betrays future generations, it betrays the essential spirit of this country. The election of Donald Trump has caused panic in environmentalist circles, but are liberals more worried about losing the planet or losing their power? Take a look at his remarks. But without bolder action, our children won't have time to debate the existence of climate change. They'll be busy dealing with its effects. More environmental disasters, more economic disruptions, waves of climate refugees seeking sanctuary. Joining me now, contributor to The Federalist and National Review, Julie Kelly. Julie, thanks for being here. Hi, Liz. Thanks for having me. All right, Julie, I want to hear your quick reaction uh, to the, to the soundbite we just played when President Obama was talking about the effects that our children are going to feel if we, if we don't deal with climate change right now. More environmental disasters, he said, more economic disruptions and waves of climate refugees. Is that an accurate picture to paint? No, it's the same doomsday scenario and rhetoric we've heard for decades that has not come true. I mean, it's funny to have these kind of conversations the week when most of the United States is in sub-zero freezing temperatures and, you know, record levels of snow. And so the rhetoric just doesn't match the reality, nor does it really, it's starting not to even match the science that has predicted so much about climate change. And so it's really time for people to, to take a harder look at this instead of just accepting this dogma that we've been told for for the last 20, 30 years. Right, and I can't, I can't keep track of what uh, climate change criers are saying. First they say, you know, we're headed toward an ice age, that's why we're having such cold weather. Then they say we're headed towards warming, that all of our ice caps are going to melt. I mean, it just, it changes on a whim. I can't even keep track. But when they talk about environmental disasters, Julie, what are they talking about? Surely they're not referring to hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes and the like. Well, they can't be because really the extreme weather scenarios that they predicted last decade has not come true. I mean, we've had fewer extreme uh, weather incidences here in the U.S. over the past decade. And when you have a scientist like Roger Pelkey who um, predicted that or who tried to disconnect extreme weather to climate science, he was outed. He was he was excommunicated from the climate tribe. And so what, what's happening is, it, and climate refugees now, that's the new one, um, Nick Kristoff in the New York Times last week blamed uh, Americans for killing children in Africa because they're climate refugees because of drought. Now, of course, there's a lot of circumstances that feed into weather and drought and extreme weather, but to blame us and blame the developing world for it, uh, there's really a lot more to that agenda than meets the eye. Right. Plus, it just seems so extreme. It's like what they said last week about Obamacare. If we roll back Obamacare, Americans are going to die. Now, if we don't wrap up all of our sovereignty and hand it with a nice bow to the United Nations uh, in, the, in the name of climate change, then all these children in Africa are going to die. It's so extreme, Julie. But l let me go back to the science thing for a second, because that's the part of it that I think whether or not, whatever your feelings, basically, whatever side of the aisle you fall on when it comes to climate change, this is, this is something that should trouble us all. Because the idea of science is that you have a hypothesis and you try from every Every side, every perspective to try to ruin it, to try to discredit it, and only when it cannot be discredited does it actually become a scientific fact or a scientific law here. And it doesn't, this doesn't seem to apply to climate change science here. It seems to be that that's uh, handled very differently and that if you try, if you try to discredit, if you try to do any research, if you try to do anything that deviates from the narrative, you're kicked out of the group. You are, and you're really, your career is damaged. I mean, there are now some really brave scientists coming out and talking about what happens when they challenge the, the reigning uh, dogma about climate change. And these, these scientists, I think there, there will be more and more of them because um, if you speak out against anything in climate science, uh, it really causes you a lot of personal professional problems. And just right there, the idea that anything, that science is settled, especially when it has something to do with climate, and it has implications on our daily lives, not just our lives, but really the lives of the global poor, energy poor, who we are really stopping from developing uh, coal, fossil fuels, and natural gas, oil to, to live their lives the same way that we do. It's really immoral what, what a lot of this climate activism has done, not just to us, but to poor people around the world. It really, it, it really needs to be reexamined. And that is what the climate people, the environmentalists, and the Obama administration are worried about, that a lot of this is going to get a hard look that it hasn't gotten in the last eight years. Right, and I, I think if they're so certain, if climate change scientists are so certain that they're correct 100% without any error whatsoever, 
they should be happy. They should actually invite challengers in to come in and say, yeah, we're right. You can attack this from any side and you won't find any error. But the fact that they're not, that's the biggest red flag about climate change uh, in our political sphere to me. But l let me ask you one more thing, Julie, before we have to go. And that's what would things like the Paris Accords do to reverse what climate change scientists say are happening? Would that actually fix the problem? It wouldn't. I mean, I think the last estimate I saw that it would stop a rise of two tenths of a of a of a percent of cent of centigrade degree. So it wouldn't even rectify the problem. And you have now they just keep expanding on it, expanding on it. You have a climatologist like Michael Mann who wants us to declare war on climate change and fight it like we did World War II. They just don't stop. And they know that none of these remedies, even the Paris Accord, would really prevent it or stop it. So they keep ratcheting it up, um, which, to your point, it makes it just so extreme as to be right. unbelievable. Right. I mean, wanting to declare war on climate change, that's not an enemy against us in that same sense. That's it's ridiculous. That's absolutely absurd. One last question, because we are running out of time, but I want to get this one in. What's going to happen under Trump? Because we know just this Monday, I believe, was the day of denial, they were calling it, climate change. Uh, climate change criers were trying to protest Trump's nominations for the EPA, for Secretary of Energy, uh, and even Secretary of State, I think, Rex Tillerson. But what's going to happen to those agencies under President Trump? It'll be interesting. I mean, especially at the EPA and energy departments, you're going to see a huge reform and overhaul. You have people in there like Rick Perry and Scott Pruitt who will go into those agencies. They're going to be able to look at all the research, the data, the email correspondence that they've had. And so, um, you know, they're really going to be able to, to, to institute some major reforms. And um, that's why they held the day against denial. That's why they have protesters at all of these confirmation hearings, uh, because that's what that's what they're afraid of. Right. What they should, they should be in support, I would think, of accountability since the EPA has refused to uh, coordinate with Congress in the past. So has the National Oceanic Association in the past with their data scandal. They won't testify. Uh, it's, we need more accountability and we need to examine this to make sure that it's real science. If that's where our money's going to go. Julie, that's all the time we have for today, but thank you so much for being here. All right, guys, our final tipping point of the night. Where are the Democrats who decried fake news as a moral abomination? Why are they not condemning the BuzzFeed dossier of fake news? We'll be right back.